Would you pray with me? Father, open the eyes of our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit, and would you speak to us now through the preaching and reading of your Holy Word? Lord, would you give us this day our daily bread? And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Our main text today is John 14, verses 1 to 6, 14, 1 to 6, with today's message titled, How Can We Know the Way? As we continue our study of the book of John in our sermon series, The Gospel of John. One religious leader in a video, uh, a video message to his church made this stunning statement some time ago. He said, many think differently, feel differently, seeking God or meeting God in different ways. In this crowd, in this range of religions, there is only one certainty we have for all. We are all children of God. Interesting concept, <laughs> neat idea, but what does the Bible say? Another popular pastor and uh, best-selling author announced his newfound belief in universalism when he said this, there are many ways to Jesus. Again, interesting concept, neat idea, but what does the Bible actually say? There are some common quotes which a lot of Americans today and even some so-called Christians uh, hold on to. Things such as, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere. Or, good people go to heaven. Or, a loving God wouldn't send people to hell. Or, if you do more good than you do bad, you will automatically go to heaven. Or, whatever works for you or feels good is true for you. Or, it's arrogant to believe that there's only one way to heaven. Again, some interesting concepts and neat ideas there, but what does our Creator's Holy Word actually say? Uh, imagine we're not in the middle of a global pandemic at the moment, so I invite you over to, to my house just up the hill from the church, and, and, and imagine now you're coming from a ways away, and, and you get to Harrisburg, okay, and then you're not sure where to go from there, and then maybe you park at the four-way stop there in Harrisburg, and, and you call me up on your cell phone and, and tell me that you're a little bit lost, and, and you tell me, look, I'm right at the intersection there of Route J and, and 124, and I'm trying to find your house. Where is it? And then imagine I say, well, just keep coming this way, and then I hang up the phone. <laughs> now, how helpful uh, would my directions be if that's what I said? Because you still would not know the way, right? And until you know the way, well, you're, you're going to be lost. I think you'll find uh, today's text is an uh, interesting conversation. Um, and at least uh, with some closer inspection, but I, I think you'll agree with me that Jesus set the conversation up. Uh, basically, it looks like Jesus primed the pump um, for, for Thomas to ask the question, how can we know the way? It was a setup. Uh, the last verse of our main text today is a familiar verse, and I imagine most of you have heard this verse, and, and maybe you have John 14, 6 memorized. You probably ought to. Jesus says these words. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Politically incorrect, but biblically correct. So, what I want to try to do today is uh, to do a deep dive on those words of Jesus and to look for the context. The who, what, when, where, and why uh, did Jesus say those words? And what's going on when he says those words? 
So let's set this up before we read the text. It's Thursday night and uh, Jesus is in the upper room. Uh, he's ready to celebrate the uh, annual Passover feast with the fellas. It, it's a memorial festival meal, which Jesus has been celebrating now every year for 30 years, right? So let me ask you a question. Have you ever wondered what it was like for Jesus to celebrate this Passover feast, this Passover meal, every year knowing that one day he would be the Passover lamb. <clears throat> Mind blown, right? Or have you ever wondered what it was like for Jesus to walk down the road to Jerusalem while other men hung from a cross crucified? Again, mind-blowing, right? But here's Jesus tonight. He's celebrating the Passover with his boys. And of course, over the last three years, they've shared a few meals, right? Uh, maybe even hundreds of meals together over three years. But this one would actually be their last meal together before he went to the cross. Wow. So, so certainly there was some tension in the room, right? The mood was sober, anxious, uncertain. Surely the emotions were high in the upper room. John quoted Jesus in John chapter 12, 27, 28. He said, now my soul is troubled. What should I say? Father, save me from this hour. But that is why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. I mean, it's been a wild few days for Jesus and the boys entering Jerusalem to the shouts and praises of thousands. Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Mary anointing the feet of Jesus with that expensive perfume. The powerful showdowns between Jesus and, and the, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, where Jesus publicly called them hypocrites and, and told them they were like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside but full of the bones of the dead. So you can see that the emotions, I mean, w would have been high as they reclined to celebrate the Passover uh, meal together. And, and then, then what happens and, and what is said during the meal uh, would have set the stage for an even, even uh, greater flood of emotions. Jesus, God the Son, the Messiah, gets up and washes their dirty, smelly feet. And Jesus tells them as he washes the dirty, smelly feet that one of them is not clean and will soon betray him. Well, that's our setup. Let's take a look as we focus our study on this passage where the question was asked, how can we know the way? Remember now, the Bible's more than information. This is more than just a book of data. It is truth. It is truth to obey, the big O, obedience. The Bible's no ordinary book. Uh, the words are like medicine for your soul. Look at absolutely, this book absolutely has the power to transform your life. So let's expect that. Let's anticipate transformation. So as good students of God's word, that means let's look for the truth that God will reveal to us today. And then let's uh, look for opportunities to obey that truth. Look for life application. What steps am I going to take tomorrow because of the truth God revealed to me today? I have the privilege of reading to you John chapter 14, verses 1 to 6. I'm reading from the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible translation. Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If not, I would have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Lord, Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? 
Jesus told him, I am the truth and the, uh, the w- I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will also know my Father. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. This is the word of the Lord. How can we know the way? James Grover Thurber lived 1894 to 1961. He was an American cartoonist, author, uh, playwright. He wrote this. He said, all men should strive to learn before they die what they are running from and to and why. A little rhyme. Cute little poem, but it has a pretty powerful point. Until you know why you're here and where you're going, you will always be lost. See, I believe this is partly why Jesus framed this conversation so that Thomas would ask, how can we know the way? This part of uh, the evening's conversation we're looking at today actually began when Jesus said these words in verse 1, don't let your heart be troubled. Who among us has never gotten lost before? I've been lost. (laughs) Surely we've all found ourselves in some unfamiliar familiar surroundings, often maybe on a schedule, and so you don't have time to be lost when you're lost. And being in a strange place and on a time crunch uh, and lost, it, it, it can cause, uh, to find, cause us to find ourselves troubled. <laughs> uh, this has happened to me more than a few times. Uh, it's happened to us more than a few times uh, in the 20 years or so of working in missions in Mexico. And honestly, All of the streets and neighborhoods in Mexico, after a while, they just begin to look the same. And it's hard to find uh, landmarks to find your way out of when you're deep into a neighborhood. And we're finally to a point now where GPS is helpful. And we, we can usually find our way back to the border crossing. If we do get lost, we can get back there. And we know how to get to most places from from the border crossing. But I've definitely been lost in Mexico a few times over the years. And I know I will eventually find my way back when it happens, but there are there are times when there comes a moment when when you start to feel troubled and uncertain. And, and depending on the task or, or where I was headed when I got lost, I may begin to think about just scrapping whatever it was I was going to do and heading heading back to camp. And and more than once. I have looked for that one place, you know, that that one place we were that time when we got those really good fresh tortillas and and where they made them right in front of you and then I can't ever find that place again. The point is, is that that's how it looks, um, how a lot of folks look at their lives. Um, they, They feel lost, they feel uncertain, and they're troubled. And often it's the uncertainty of life, which is the biggest cause of anxiety. I think we could say the word for the year of 2020 for a lot of us so far has been uncertainty. Not very fond of that word after this year. Most of us are facing varying levels of uncertainty, questions swirl around in our heads when when we're in times of uncertainty. What if I or somebody I love uh, gets the COVID? Huh. Um, will I still have a job next week or, or next month? Will I ever be able to retire now? Will life ever go back to normal? And what even is normal anyway? Everything normal in our lives can be stripped away in a single moment. Disease, economic collapse, and yes, even the loss of a loved one. But folks, please allow me to remind you of this one thing. Money, health, our jobs, etc., they were never a sure thing. Though we may find ourselves at times lulled into some sense of security, be clear, that's always a false sense of security. You see, that's basically what Jesus was saying. He basically said, look, nothing on this earth is a sure thing. Look, nothing in this temporary place, which is not your permanent home, is a sure thing. Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled. 
In Matthew 6, Jesus also said, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So let me say it again. Money, health, or our jobs were never a sure thing. Nothing on this earth is a sure thing. That's what tends to drive us nuts, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, if only there was a trusted way, we could just know which way to go. <laughs> if only there was a trusted way, we could just know which truth to trust. If only we could just have a blessed assurance that life really will turn out. Okay, then, then maybe we might be able to hold on. So you see, Jesus primed the, prompt, uh, the pump and set it up so that Thomas would ask, Lord, how can we know the way? so that Jesus could then provide the answer. If you're looking for the way to go, that's me. He said, if you're looking for the truth you can trust, that's me. If you're looking for a blessed assurance that life really will be okay, that's me. Jesus said, do you trust in God? Then trust in me, because I am the way, the truth, and the life. So maybe we ought to ask ourselves this question. What is it about Jesus which makes him the way, the truth, and the life. Sometimes I've given the advice to husbands leading their families or, or to people who are in some kind of leadership role that you cannot follow a parked car. I think that's good advice. <laughs> when the TV series Lost uh, was airing on network television. I, I remember having a chuckle when I would see somebody sometimes wearing a hat or a t-shirt that just said lost on the front. Maybe you've seen the bumper sticker that says, don't follow me, I'm lost. The Google tells me that there are some 4,300 world religions. That means there are some 4,300 religious leaders out there trying to say, follow me. I know where I'm going. Funny thing, though, in every other world religion, you can remove the founder or the leader and still keep all the teachings intact. So in other words, you can take Muhammad out of Islam, you still got Islam. You can take Buddha out of Buddhism, you still have Buddhism. Hinduism has no founder or a leader to follow, never did have one. It's just a way of life that somebody made up. But look, you can't take Jesus out of our faith and still have Christianity. It all, everything hinges on Jesus. You see, that's why Jesus could say these words, Hey, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. The Apostle Paul put it like this in his letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 3.11. He said, For no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid down. That foundation is Jesus Christ. So you see, it all, everything hinges on Jesus. Folks, without Jesus, you got a whole lot of nothing. Okay, but still, though, why should that actually make a difference? I mean, what is it about Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life that's supposed to help us deal with things uh, which might give us a troubled heart? Well, let's dive a little deeper into that. First of all, Jesus is the way. He says, the way, capital W. When you find Jesus, you're no longer lost. Because Jesus is the way. Here's the reality for, for lost people in this world. 
That is people who've not yet surrendered their life to Jesus. Many are afraid, you see, that their lives are heading for a dead end. They, they've made plenty of bad choices in life. They, they've gone down a few wrong roads in their life, and, and they're afraid that when the dust settles, their lives are actually empty. But you see, as true disciples... As genuine followers of Jesus, we know, oh, hallelujah, we know we don't have to worry about that with Jesus. But once you turn your life over to him, he fixes all that. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. You see, when Jesus recreates us, when he makes us a new creation, he gives us things to do, good works that he prepared in advance. He planned on before we got here that we would do them when we did. So when that happens, we have a promise from 1 Corinthians 15. The Apostle Paul tells us, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in what? In the Lord's work. Why, he says, because you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. In other words, when we give our life to God, then serve him according to his call on our life. It's not a dead end. It's not in vain. Our life is not empty, it has purpose. And look, it won't matter if you've made some bad choices. It won't matter if you've gone down the wrong road. Since Jesus is the way for you, when the dust settles, you're going to arrive at a good place, the best place for your final destination. Why? Because Jesus is the way. So first of all, Jesus is the way, capital W. Then Jesus is the truth, capital T. Don't be confused into thinking that I'm particularly handy. But I do own more than one tape measure. So <laughs> there's that, right? I mean, I got different sizes of tape measures, different lengths. Honestly, though, they're, I mean, they're pretty manly masculine tape measures, but also, honestly, there's nothing too special about them. You know, they're just like thousands of other tape measures across the United States, around the world. But did you ever wonder about the accuracy of a tape measure? Like, did you ever double check one tape measure to another to see if they, if they line up? <laughs> I use them to measure things around the house, right? Because they tell me the truth about how long an inch or a foot or a yard is. Now, my tape measures are not the truth. They simply tell me truth. The truth of that measurement is actually found in Washington, D.C., in the National Institute of Standards and Technology, where they keep perfect, absolutely perfect prototypes of weights and measurements. Our measurements of inches and feet and yards are based on those prototypes. So when you use that truth in Washington, D.C. as the basis of measurement, you don't have to worry if your tape measure is accurate. The, the prototype in Washington, D.C. is the truth. It's the measure of truth. So who cares, right? Well, you see, in the same way, Jesus is the truth for all the world to rely on. He's the reality against which everything else in the world is measured. So, for example, let me ask you a question. Do you know how valuable you are? Well, here's the answer to that question. For God so loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only son. Why? So that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16, there's your answer. So look, you were so valuable to God. You, you were so valuable to God that Jesus came to die on a cross for you. <laughs> that truth right there tells you all you need to know about how much God cares for all of us and about God's love and God's mercy. That truth right there tells us all that we need to know. That truth right there tells us all that we need to know about how we can be forgiven 
forgiven of things uh, of which would embarrass us, which would cause us to be ashamed. Forgiven. Let me just tell you something. Look, that truth right there is more important than anything else that a lost world can ever, ever, ever offer you. Why? Because Jesus is the truth. So first of all, Jesus is the way. Then uh, Jesus is the truth. And finally then, Jesus is the life. The life, capital L, life. How many of you know what the gospel is? What, what is the gospel? The Greek word that we translate as gospel literally means good news. That's why those are interchangeable. So what is God's gospel or what is God's good news? The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, that Christ did die for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day. So the gospel, or, or the good news, is that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried, and then he rose from the dead. It's just that simple. He died, he was buried, he rose from the dead. So it is through that gospel or through that good news, that we have life in Jesus. As Southern Baptists, we believe that the Bible tells us that it is only after we receive this new life in Jesus that we then choose to be baptized, and we do so in obedience. Obedience to the command of Jesus to get baptized. It's an issue of obedience, not of salvation. Jesus said to do it, so we do it. Um, we do not believe that baptism saves you. It's just an act of obedience after you are saved. The, the gospel or the good news of Jesus is his death. His burial, His resurrection. Look, what needed to be done for us to be able to be saved has already been done by Jesus. We don't save ourselves then by getting baptized. Our, our Southern Baptist uh, statement of faith, we call it the Baptist faith and message. It describes baptism as a symbolic act of obedience and testimony of the believer's faith in Jesus Christ to other people. And since baptism is a command of Jesus, it's required for membership in a Southern Baptist church. But again, the scripture does not tell us that baptism itself brings new life. The new life is in Jesus because Jesus is the life. The new life is in Jesus because of what he did when he died for us on the cross, when he was buried, when he was resurrected. When we get baptized, you see, it symbolizes what it is which Jesus did for us on the cross and what it is we're surrendering our life to in our new life in Christ Jesus. Now, a lot of folks have gotten baptized over the years who have not actually yet really made a genuine uh, surrender, have not really committed their heart to Jesus. And, and God looks at the heart and he knows the difference. Therefore, those people, when they do that, baptism really doesn't mean much to them. That's why so many people will find themselves ready to get re-baptized at a later date in their lives because they have actually now finally made a real deal commitment for the first time. This is why my wife and I uh, have not just immediately baptized uh, our kids as they come up in age the first time that they bring it up. As parents, we want to make sure that they really understand it, that they really mean it, that they, that they have genuinely uh, experienced a real conversion. When a person has a for real uh, has for real believed in Jesus as their Savior and confessed their sinful nature and genuinely chosen Jesus, uh, uh, making to chosen to live for Jesus, surrender their life to Him, making Him Lord and Master of their life. Then getting baptized, you see, it's a real has a real deal, eternal impact in their life, and it means so much more to them. 
when we get baptized, we're allowing ourselves to symbolize being buried in a watery grave. And so we're symbolically buried with Jesus. And then we symbolically rise up with Jesus to walk in newness of life. The Apostle Paul wrote to the house churches in Rome, uh, Romans 6, 3 and 4. Are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? For therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we may walk in newness of life. Well, let's wrap this thing up today in our main text in a passage under the heading, The Way to the Father. Jesus orchestrates that conversation in such a way that Thomas would pose the question, how can we know the way? And Jesus responded with a familiar verse and, and one we ought to memorize. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Then he said, if you know me, you'll also know my father. According to both Jesus and his apostles on multiple different occasions in the, in the New Testament, uh, there's one path to being rescued and restored to eternity in glory with our creator. And that one path is Jesus by way of the cross. If there are several paths, when they all said there was only one path, then Jesus lied, number one. Number two, the apostles lied. Number three, Jesus wasted his time dying on the cross. And number four, the suffering and the death of not only Jesus, but also his apostles it just wasn't necessary. Look, can I just tell you something? A doctrine which teaches there are several ways may very well feel warm and fuzzy and comfortable. But here's the thing. Jesus didn't call us to be warm and fuzzy and comfortable. You won't find that in his book. Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I'm not making that up. That's what Jesus, the Messiah, said. Folks, Jesus, God the Son, is God's grace on full display. If you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. And when we look at Jesus, what do we see? We see a kind of stunning, uh, scandalous, uh, unexplainable love, mercy, and grace. And it's just all balled up into one. Jesus is about to be slaughtered on the cross. He's going to die a horrible death. And he knows it. And the fellows are like, wait, what, you're leaving us? <laughs> because they apparently haven't heard a word that he said, right? And Thomas boldly asked, how can we know the way? And so Jesus says, what, are you kidding me? Three years with me and you guys are dumber now than we started out. Nope. That's not what he said. No, Jesus has compassion on him. And he says, hey, fellas, listen, don't let your hearts be troubled. Folks, I'm telling you, if you want to know what God looks like, look at Jesus. Look at how he responded to the people that he encountered. The woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, the, the tax collectors. And he often uh, is often clueless and, and slow on the uptake disciples. The poor, the weak, the sinner, the outcast, the broken, the marginalized of his day. How did he respond? What would Jesus do? He encouraged them. He spoke life into them. He touched them. He ate with them. He stands up for them. And he invites them to follow him. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'm going to close with this statement and I want to pray with you. Jesus is the truth about who God is and also the truth of God about who we are. Let that stew around a little bit. Let's pray. Lord, we gather...
together, even virtually. We, we come into agreement in the wonderful and powerful name of Jesus. Father, we praise your holy name. We, we thank you for Jesus and for the power of your Holy Spirit. Almighty God, thank you for sending your Son. Thank you for rescuing and restoring us. Thank you for forgiveness. Father, we want to spend all of eternity in glory with you. God in heaven, I believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I, I have accepted him and asked him to save my soul. Forgive uh, me where I have failed you and, and be with me as I grow closer to you. And Father, I lift up every person listening and watching this video that they might have that same prayer within their heart. That they might also understand and believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. That they might receive him as their Savior or lead others to do the same. Father, open our eyes to see the love that you have for each one of us and give us the courage to allow your love to transform us as we do our best to walk in the light and in the way that you have laid out for us. Father, I confess to you on behalf of any person watching today that we are all sinners. Every last one of us, we fail you. We fall short. We are less than perfect. We say and do what we should not. We don't say and do what we should. We sense your leading in one direction. We head off in the other direction. We have a sin problem. But you provided a solution before we even got here. What an incredible concept. You sent your son to die on a cross for us. You sent your son to restore and rescue us. Thank you for Jesus. Father, I lift up anyone watching today who may be walking a guilty distance, struggling in their walk with you, having a hard time looking you in the eyes, and maybe distracted by sin in their life or Areas where Satan has taken a stronghold, they may be listening to the lies of the devil. And I pray right now in the powerful name of Jesus that they would know there was nothing they were ever going to say or do that was going to make you love them more or make you love them less. You love them the same since the moment of salvation. You're just patiently waiting for them to come back to you, to look you in the eye so that you can put them back to work again. And Father, if there is even a single person watching today in this moment who does not yet know you, so most of what I had to say today made little to no sense since your Holy Spirit doesn't yet live inside them. Father, would you call out their name right now in such a way that they would know it was you, that they would feel compelled to answer their heart's door where you stand knocking. Give them the courage, Father, to surrender their life to you to take Jesus as their Savior, to take that first step to spend all of eternity with you. Father, we love you. It's in the powerful name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.